Hello, welcome back to another Big Deno painting video. This will be focused on the Gold Smoke Knight from Kingdom Death and predominantly talking through the non-metallic metal that I have used on his armour and some of the basic smoke effects. So if you haven't watched any of my other videos, i uh, probably recommend you start with a couple of those. Uh, this one is slightly more advanced, aimed at people who have a basic knowledge of uh, some of the other concepts I talk through. Uh, this is the base coat of the sketch and refine process. The reason I chose this purple colour, uh, it's actually a colour called Charlotte's Red from Nocturna Paints. Uh, is that actually ties in a little bit with the rest of the Kingdom Death models I've painted. So I've gone through and done the majority of the core box set and some of the expansion monsters and I've tried to keep a fairly, I guess, unnatural looking skin tone uh, and unnatural ambience, ambience. And so I've used this Charlotte's Red as a base coat. Uh, the eventual gold will look a little bit uh, more like gold, but I feel like having that residual colour underneath helps uh, the tonalities of this model and the other models in the range that I've done. So my, my process with non-metallic metal is... Uh, uh, I won't say unique because I think... There's a lot of people that do non-metallic metal in a pretty similar way. Uh, but this is, I don't follow any specific rules. I just uh, try to think about each object uh, individually and how the light would interact. And by breaking each section down into those volumes, it allows you to uh, treat each one individually, which is helpful when you're I'm trying to paint those individual sections, but it's it's it needs to be more than that when you uh, start looking at the piece holistically, because uh, not only is each of those individual segments uh, a volume that needs to be highlighted, but you need to treat the whole model uh, as a volume as well and sort of be consistent with your lighting approach. And one way that I try to do that is by by bouncing uh, light off. Uh, other sections and so you'll see uh, on cylinders like this leg here um, I've actually done two sort of lines of light uh, one uh, being the main sort of highlight the light coming down uh, from above and the second one being a, a bouncing light a light that bounces from another surface another example of this uh, you'll see when I get around to it uh, is on that that kick-ass gut, gut plate what a, what a model this is, by the way. Super cool. Um, uh, so the light uh, would be bouncing around, and one area it would be bouncing from is from below, and so I do actually add some, uh, some light coming from underneath, which helps sell the, the effect of metal as metal. I like to think of it as it talks to each other. It's always you know, bouncing around all sorts of different places, and so... Uh, the placement of the of the lights uh, obviously has to be related to the volumes, but I think it's also important with non-metallic metal and with uh, highly reflective surfaces that you also take into consideration the uh, viewing angle. Um, and when I say viewing angle, I, I mean particularly with non-metallic metal, you, you do have to have a fixed uh, viewing position in many ways to help sell the effect. This doesn't necessarily equate to you can only look at the model from one direction and it looks good. Um, but it does help give you some consistency with how you approach your, your lights and shadows. Um, and so when you have a, a fixed viewing angle, one thing that uh, metal does differently to, to other objects. So if you, if you treated... Um, a piece of fabric with a with a highlight generally what you see is where the light is coming from the 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 source usually from above uh, the 
highlight will be at the top of that volume because that's where the light's hitting it. With metallic surfaces, uh, the light changes where it should be highlighted from because where um, the actual viewer is standing is relevant for where the light highlights should be reflecting from. And so if uh, the gut plate's a really great example for this and it's actually why I chose this model. You can see that I, I'm not highlighting uh, from the very top. I'm actually highlighting from where the object is most rounded, which is in that central uh, middle part of the torso. Because if you're standing in front of this model and looking directly at him, that's where the light is going to uh, bounce off based on your viewing angle as a viewer. So it's a little bit of a, um, a difficult concept, I think, to explain. Uh, but if you have a look at the finished model, you'll probably get a bit better sense of what I'm trying to say. I think it's called specular highlights or something like that. I'm sure if you looked it up online, someone far better than me has probably explained it already. So uh, with non-metallic metal in general, it's more important to progress from very, very dark to very, very light. And to, to have that broad spectrum from uh, almost zero up to 10 on the value scale. Again, if you haven't watched any of my other videos, I highly recommend some of those to understand some of these statements. Um, you need to go from ultra dark to ultra light to sell the, the metallic effect. And so <clears throat> probably uh, non-metallic metal is actually one of the only times that I'll actually highlight through quite a broad range of colors. Uh, normally I'll only highlight through one or two stages, but with this I'll actually highlight uh, up through most colors in the gradient. Uh, before finishing up on, on a pure white. Um, although, as you'll see as we progress, uh, there's a few tricks that I use along the way. So, um, this, this color is golden ochre Vallejo. Uh, and I think the, the next color is yellow ochre from Vallejo. And then we finally end on ice yellow and white uh, also from Vallejo, or ivory, I think, from Vallejo. So you can see sort of more what I'm talking about there with the, with the placement of the highlights. So although you do get uh, light catching the edges of objects, and you'll see uh, that I highlight every edge from the, from the top side, as well as a lot of edges from the bottom side, again, reflecting that light bouncing around. Um, so this is as always, not very clean or smooth. Um, I'm not uh, generally willing to spend the time on gaming models to, to refine and make things ultra smooth at this stage. Again, some of the stages that I go through later on will help soften these transitions, but it's, uh, it's not necessary to be ultra clean at this point. What you want to focus on is hitting the lights in exactly the right spots. So um, we move into the, the yellow ochre here and the actual light situation starts to feel a little bit more like metal. And uh, this, is, this is only about 20 minutes worth of, of painting. And again, one of the advantages of, of this approach is, uh, is you get to get a sense of how the model's looking without it needing to be hours and hours of work. Um, you, can, you can get a feeling of if the model's going to work or if it needs changing, refining, or, or switching and starting with a new approach. Uh, so I was pretty happy with how the model started to look, especially with this colour on. I think the gold starts to come alive a little bit. And this color is uh, one that is pretty crucial for selling gold uh, for, for my approach. There's other colors you can use, of course. 
Uh, so again, just, just respecting those volumes um, when you have uh, two surfaces that are, have, a, have a sharp edge side by side uh, to help create more of a contrast and more of a transition. You can see I've uh, put the hard light on one side, uh, one edge, and then had the object that's closest to that on the other side, the other panel, uh, being dark. And that just helps, again, sell the, the metallic effect. In terms of um, how realistic this is and how, how true this is to life, it's, it's not. Um, one of the most effective true-to-life metals I've seen in miniature paintings done by Land Studio or Kirill Knave. Both those guys do just wild non-metallic metal. And Oh, that's a good shot, Deno. Painting on the camera, that'll help. Good work. Uh, those two guys do stuff that just looks like metal, like you could pick it up in your hand and you would think that it was a metallic surface. I don't try to do that, and I think uh, it's important to understand what you want your your metal, your model to look like. Uh, for me, I have a very uh, illustrative style, lots of lots of big contrasts and sketchy colors and sketchy lights and so I think my non-metallic metal has to reflect that style but this approach you can adapt to a much more realistic uh, style as well um, it's just understanding oh this is good so <clears throat> understanding exactly how uh, metal should react and you can then take this technique and spend more time refining uh, just a little bit on the camera angles here, so haven't done any painting on camera for a little while. This is the first one in a, in about uh, two months or three months, I think. And uh, I also used a little bit of a camera digital editing to zoom in, so you'd get a better angle. Uh, but as you can see, we're also unfortunately catching some moments of no model painting in shot which is outstanding. Uh, so the, the, the breastplate is, is a really great example of, I think, how to sell uh, metal as metal. Um, it's all about the placement of the highlights. You, you don't really need to do anything. There's no technical difference in how, how you, you know, apply your pain or anything like that. It's just you need to uh, shift the way that you approach highlighting and shading uh, in, a, in a pretty dramatic way to be able to sell an object as a metal surface. When you uh, when you compare this surface beside you know, this cloak or fabric, there, there needs to be something different, otherwise it will just look like that same type of material. And you see a lot of um, painters that are, that are just learning how to do non-metallic metal, uh, trying to do steel, and often it just looks grey. It just looks like a, a, a grey object, uh, not a metallic object. And in, for many uh, painters, the reason for this is that the highlights are too similar to how you would see an object uh, that is non-metallic like fabric highlighted so as we move into the ice yellow now you can you can clearly see how I'm leaving that that gap between the upper part of the surface and the central part of the surface which is again just bringing bringing the intent of a, a viewing position creating those lights and that was the little light from below bouncing around so uh, this is a mixture of ice yellow and yellow ochre i think uh, we haven't gone into full ice yellow yet um, i talk a lot in a couple of my other videos about uh, atmosphere and how the environment should impact your your objects uh, whether any part of the model the, the environment that they're in always impacts uh, the way that you paint them uh, for this particular model, I do have quite a lot of fire 
happening. Uh, and so there's a lot of a lot of warmth in the metal. There are a lot of different ways to approach a non-metallic metal for, for me. I try to uh, always consider the atmosphere and the environment as, as one of the, the first things I do. So this color, this gold is a very warm color. Uh, there's some, some hints of orange added to it later on just to help uh, remind viewers that uh, the model exists in the same environment as it is standing in. Again, a, a common trap for beginning non-metallic metal painters is to just use the same gray colors, the same grays, and uh, that doesn't then reflect what is happening in the model around it. So, uh, so you can, again, start to see that metal really beginning to take shape now. And as we move into uh, ice yellow, pure ice yellow, and the highlights become much more considered and uh, placed with a little bit more precision, you can see how the effect is beginning to come to life. It is one of my favorite things to paint at the moment, non-metallic metal, and as frustrating as it is sometimes, and as frustrating as I find it not coming out the way I want it, which does happen with alarming regularity. But it is, it is really fun to try and understand how all of these little, all these little surfaces talk to each other. And I think probably the reason why I chose to do uh, non-metallic metal on my entire Kingdom Death collection, as opposed to uh, the majority of my other board game models, which are done with true metallics, uh, is just because the, the opportunity to practice on some surfaces like this one and uh, some of the other models have some really sublime metallic surfaces. It's just a great chance to try this, this technique and uh, expanding my uh, approach in uh, a different way. So this is, this is very, very uh, bright lights and you're probably wondering what the hell you're doing, Deno. This looks like shit. Uh, you're right, it does. But thanks to the wonders of the airbrush, we shall smooth it all out. So in the airbrush there, I've used uh, two colors, the yellow ochre, which was the mid-tone for this, and the contrast paint, something yellow, Nasdreg or something, I can't remember, is a yellow, it's sort of a muddy yellow, dirty yellow, but, and what this is doing is it's creating a filter over the surface. It has the effect of softening all of those rough and sketchy highlights that I just did, and creating a, a unification across the surfaces that help cells it as one, one surface one object, which was again one of those things I was talking about earlier, is you need your non-metallic metal to not just be individual volumes, but a unified volume as well. So th the airbrush is, I won't say it's integral to the process, because you can do that without an airbrush, it just makes it a uh, lot quicker. Um, and this stage that I'm doing here is, uh, again, another integral part of the way that I approach uh, metals and airbrushes. And if you've watched any of my other videos, this will not be unfamiliar to you. I'm just going back in and adding in that, that depth of contrast that this needs. So when you use the airbrush in the way that I just did there, which uh, unifies and smooths, it also has the effect of reducing the contrast, whether it's uh, from a light color such as that ice yellow and the ivory, bringing it back down towards the mid-tone, but it also has the same effect on the shadows. It will bring those shadows up and brighten the shadows. And uh, again, when you're trying to sell an effect like metal, you need the, the sharpness of contrast 
the very clear dark and light elements or otherwise it doesn't look quite right and in, in many cases it's the it's the very last highlight the, the little sparkle light as I like to call it that that makes it look like metal I mean this this object now this surface now looks relatively convincing but as you'll see a little bit later on I, I do actually do a few more tweaks and it goes from convincing to in my opinion red hot pun not intended for the gold smoke night so the the actual color i'm using here it's not black it's a uh, it's a scale fantasy color called arbuckles brown i have mixed a little black in with it uh, but i wanted you can see that the that crimson color that purple color has, has almost uh, disappeared and it's still there and subtly there but what you're seeing more of is uh, the yellow and crimson mixed together and if you consider what happens when you mix yellow and red together normally you get an orange and that's what we're seeing in the shadows is a little bit more of an orange but when you have a dark orange you have brown and that's uh, exactly uh, why I've used a, a dark brown to put shadows in uh, it also again helps sell the effect of of gold this gold is a a yellow color and shading and highlighting of yellow uh, is usually done with orange or brown uh, so this is this is the ice yellow again and you can see this is about those little sparkle highlights that I was talking about get it on screen down come on mate you can do it this this is for me the the uh, aspect the the moment where you really start to see the metal look like metal you do you do get a little bit of um, I do a little bit more smoothing after this and a few more tweaks but this this is how you convince your viewer that they're looking at a metallic surface the sparkle and getting that placement right of where the light goes is crucial to selling it as metal and that that helmet is also another good example of the viewing angle being important for where the highlight goes uh, so you could uh, the advantage of this process of this approach that i take is you can just uh, spend as much or a little time as you like and once you have something that you're satisfied with uh, you can move on and because of the the speed of that approach that can happen very quickly uh, this model I spent a total of one hour and 37 minutes painting uh, not including the base and the finished result was something I was very happy with could have spent more time on it absolutely uh, didn't need to to get the result that I wanted uh, which is a gaming model so here we're gonna do the cloak very very quickly one, one thing I'm using a lot of at the moment is contrast paints I think they're a really good product actually I don't think they're the product as advertised uh, the, the one solution for your uh, painting to straight out of the pot turn you into a great painter but they, they're a really uh, good saturated wash and so I use washes sometimes in my in my painting and I also use the airbrush a lot and it's it's a really uh, nice uh, color to put through an airbrush the contrast colors because they're actually a color that doesn't have any uh, the, the way they're constructed is slightly transparent and so putting them through the airbrush you get that transparency which allows you to do nice filters and colors at the top uh, if you haven't seen any of my other videos this is wet in wet it's a pretty uh, easy technique you blob colors on together on the model and that's it I use it a lot for fur 
and for hair. Um, in this particular instance, uh, there is a little bit more work to come, but it just creates a nice unified surface to work from. See that spatter in the background? This is uh, something I've experienced a couple of times before. It's from closing my Chimera white paint. Uh, however, this isn't my first rodeo, and so I always angle my closing of the lid away from the model I'm painting. That is from experience. Yes, I have spattered my model with white paint drops before. It was not fun. Uh, but what we're moving on to now is the s fiery smoke. This guy's called Gold Smoke Knight. Doesn't leave you a lot of room for opportunities in flexing your painting muscles about which way you approach the colours, but there it is. Uh, so one thing I've been using on the majority of my Kingdom Death models is uh, some fluorescent paints for their, their little lantern things. They all carry little lanterns around. And uh, fluorescent paints can be quite tricky to work with. So uh, I've mixed two fluorescent paints here, a fluorescent orange and a fluorescent yellow. One's from Scale 75 and one's from Vallejo. And the colours will pretty much only work over a white undercoat. If you try to paint them over black, it doesn't, doesn't work. just doesn't, doesn't sell. Uh, the pigment doesn't translate at all. So you pretty much have to do that layer of white first for any, any sort of fluorescent paints. Now, once again, this is, this is a rough and ready and quick and quick and tumble. You can, you can spend more time than I've spent smoothing out the white, which does have the effect of, uh, assisting the, the fluorescent paints, uh, selling how they look. Again, this is a gaming piece and because it's supposed to be quite ashen and smoky, this is an effect I'm okay with at the moment. You will see I do quite a number of layers here. Uh, I am using the hairbrush in between those layers, hair dryer, hairbrush. Yeah, I was just brushing my hair in between coats, waiting for it to dry. No, I was using my hair dryer to dry the paint. It's one of my favorite tools and significantly speeds up just about every process I do and is one of the tricks that allow me to be as quick a painter as I am. So again, what I'm doing here is I'm, I started with the brightest color, which is the yellow and orange. Then I'm going to move into just the fluorescent orange and move outwards. Fun thing, a lot of people get flames wrong. They get them backwards. The flame is brightest at the center and darkest at the edges. I remember the first couple of times I painted flame, I did it in reverse. Again, just, just the way that we naturally think about surfaces and objects from painting for many years, Games Workshop models and other models. And it's, a, it's sometimes a tricky habit to break. Uh, so again, more hair, drier there, and as you can see, that that is quite a vibrant color. It's purely because of that white underneath. It would be uh, much muddier and uglier and harder to see if not for that. So uh, I, now I'm going to move into a little bit of airbrushing. Now you can you can use the fluorescent paint through the airbrush from the start. Uh, I didn't I didn't want to do that here because. It does take a lot of coats to get that uh, level of finish that I got. And I didn't want to catch any overspray on the armor, the head, etc. This is great camera work. I'm going to have to shift my angle slightly. Uh, I didn't want to catch too much. I did want to catch some, and that's why I did the airbrush at this stage, because I wanted to catch some of that color. On those other areas nearby without catching all of it. So I'm using the airbrush for the shading of the smoke which is fun uh, and so I'm going up through a bit of the red now with some contrast red and the 
uh, fluorescent orange. And you can see I'm just putting that on the ends, on the tips of the flames. Again, you can see a lot of precision. Precision is my middle name. So we'll probably get put on my gravestone, Trent Precision Denison. He loved painting with precision. <clears throat> and then finally, I'll mix a little bit of uh, black into that color. I, I generally mix my paints in the cup of the airbrush. And oh, a little bit of hair dry there, get it done. The cup sometimes has leftover paint, like the red. So I'll mix a touch of black in, which helps homogenize the color from before. Still has a little bit of that red there. And there you go. So that's the flame almost done. I do go back in and add a touch more of the, uh, the white and then the fluorescent yellow and orange, because I do want to have some really bright lights in the big city. But those, those two elements, from start to, to finish of what we've just done there has taken one hour. And that that makes up the majority of this model, which again is probably one of the coolest models I've painted uh, recently. I dig it. So, yes, painting non-metallic metal and painting flame and fire and stuff, it doesn't have to take uh, forever. A lot of people, I think, have that misconception that these sorts of te techniques, these advanced techniques, uh, take a lot of time. Uh, they don't have to. It all comes down to how much time you want to spend on uh, refining the details. And for a model like this, which is, is going to be predominantly used for gaming purposes, I don't need to spend another four or five hours on creating those ultra smooth transitions and ultra smooth blends because it's just not going to uh, make a noticeable difference uh, to, a, to a normal viewer. Uh, so here we're going to go back in with the white. Oh, come on, Dano. Come on, mate. That's better. Uh, just adding some white very, very close to the uh, the f flames, I don't know what the word is, fuel, heart, where it comes from, there you go, so just making sure that there's the lightest part of the flame, the purest, brightest part of the flame is where the object starts. Uh, one thing I do tend to see with people painting object source lighting uh, and something I've consciously chosen not to do with this Kingdom Death collection. Uh, you, you don't get a lot of uh, light bouncing around from object source lighting such as these lanterns. You don't get a lot of that colour hitting on the surfaces around it if you have bright lights around it. So what, what I mean by that is if you hold up a match in the middle of the day, you don't get orange and yellow light reflecting off your face if someone was looking at you because you've got the much more powerful daylight which is what you're seeing. And so because I've painted all of these models with quite strong, uh, saturated, vibrant colors, I'm working on the concept that there is a strong light somewhere, but it isn't the lanterns that's causing the lighting. And so because the lanterns aren't responsible for the light, they're not casting that orange glow brightly onto the other surfaces. Now you can do that, but you should only do that if the rest of the model has lighting that is consistent with that. 
pretty pretty common mistake uh, I've seen. And uh, if you go back to that match example and you take a, a match, light a match, and hold it up near your face uh, at night time in the, in the dark, all of a sudden you get a lot of orange glows and interesting bouncing colors. So that's something that you see a lot of people trying to uh, use, especially I've seen quite a few Kingdom Death models recently as I've done some research and uh, you do see a lot of Kingdom Death models with lanterns where they're casting a lot of orange light around, but then you're also seeing a strong light from other areas and it doesn't quite work like that. There are situations where that does work like neon lights and you know, our lighting, um, modern lighting is significantly stronger and can have that effect, but uh, not, not generally the case with this sort of lighting. Uh, this is contrast paints again. Another cool thing you can use them for is fur and hair and it's just saves you a lot of time. The, the key to using them in my experience is doing the work underneath to allow them to uh, work not too hard, just to use them for their saturation and to filter the layers underneath in the same way that I did through the airbrush, that's just with a brush. Uh, they do dry very shiny, they have a, a shiny finish and that's one of their downsides. I control that by using a matte varnish through the airbrush, the AK Ultra Matte Interactive, AK Interactive, kick-ass paint range, and the best matte varnish on the market. So to go completely contrary to everything I just said about lighting, non-metallic metal is the opposite because it is a highly reflective surface. So when you have an object that is punching out a light, fabric or faces or other materials in daylight don't generally reflect that color and that light, but metal, because it's highly reflective, does. I've tried to keep it quite subtle on these models and you'll see later on when I when I get into doing the thun, well, that's not a thunder mall, I can't remember what it's called. He's at a big swing and mace. His big swing and mace, I do use a little bit of the yellowy orange colour as a as a tint on the metal. But again, it isn't it isn't just glowing uh, like the fire itself. Also has to do with the distance it's at. Uh, so I, I have a pretty similar approach for steel. Again, you're seeing a lot of green in there. I, I pulled out V Vallejo model color, VMC emerald just before. So again, this is about the consistency of the rest of the range of colors I'm doing. I've got a very cold and uh, ethereal sort of colors going. So I've used this green mixed in with my German grey for the base coats of the non-metallic metal. And the silver is done exactly the same way as the gold, but because this is much further away from the, the focus of the model, which is obviously the chest and the face, I'm not putting as much uh, contrast and attention on that maul. I don't want that to be glowing super bright. I want the focus to be clearly on his face and on his chest. So you'll see the these little line things. I think there's a pretty cool back backstory to this dude and stuff if you've played the campaign. It's pretty cool. There's a reason he's got lines. Um Yeah, so I'm keeping the, the brightness of those significantly more than the brightness of the mall itself uh, intentionally because I want that focus to stay up top. But you will see the uh, mall itself does get quite a stark contrast from light to dark. 
Again, coming back to that first point of metal needing to go through all of the ranges of light to dark to convince the viewer that they are looking at metal. Uh, that cylindrical object that the you're seeing there um, at the end of the, the mall is a great example of that same viewing angle concept and how the light would be striking that surface from the perspective of the viewer. Uh, I have a, another rule which I like to prescribe to which is the rule of cool. Uh, you should always follow the rule of cool, it's the number one rule. Uh, if something isn't necessarily correct in terms of your, your highlighting or your interpretation of an object, as long as it looks cool, you can sort of roll with it. And this this mall is a great example of probably not correctly highlighted from the light perspective that the rest of the model is lit from. But it does uh, look quite cool. So uh, the two colors there are snake bite leather and creed camo. I've diluted them quite heavily with Joe Sonia Magic Mix to really control uh, their finish. And that they don't, I don't want them at all to act like a like a wash, like a Devlin mud. I just want them to filter the tones of the of the surface and change the color to be a little bit warmer and a little bit more consistent with the base colors, the colors of the base, because once again, I want the metal to reflect the environment that it exists in. So we're coming up on uh, an hour and a half and the model's almost finished. <laughs> um, I did actually paint the base as well off camera. It's not done on camera. Uh, it's using pretty much the same colors as what you've already seen, the contrast paints, etc. Uh, you will see my I, I glue them to the base, which I think is an important part of the process so you can really assess the model as a whole before you call it finished. Um, but yeah, this, this model took all up about two hours from start to finish. And so I feel like if you can, if you can do a model, uh, in that sort of time frame, th there's no, there's no excuses for not giving, giving it a crack, non-metallic metal and this sort of stuff, uh, respecting where you're at with your skill level, of course, and not trying to reach too far, but it's certainly something you can achieve if you've, uh, if you've got some confidence and you're willing to give it a crack. Uh, as I said, it's, it's something I'm really enjoying painting at the moment. And, uh, that's, that's the reason I paint is for fun and for relaxation. And so I've got cool armies to play with and cool models to play with and cool models to look at. So, uh, believe that's pretty much all of the stuff I wanted to talk about in this in this video so the final the final highlights uh, for the the model I do some some quick touches of of orange on the uh, steel a few more little bright lights with the uh, the gold a couple of little ice yellow highlights and then uh, do the face, the eyes, I think, there we go, there's the base, uh, you'll notice that the, the flames on the base are a little bit darker than the ones that are on the, uh, on the model, again, conscious decision, don't want the base to be drawing too much focus, I want the, the focus to be purely on the model, so the base, even though the fire should be consistent, is a little bit darker, just to keep the focus where I want it. So yeah, these last stages are just the, the final lights and shadows, which sells the, the effect and also probably the most relaxing and fun part to do because it's 
very, very easy. You're just using the, the shape of the brush and relatively dilute paint just to touch those models where they, oh, love it. Very relaxing. So I varnish all my gaming models. I use Tester's Dull Coat to create a very firm protective seal. But before I do that, I do use the AK Interactive just to create a nice finish. Uh, all of those finishes to be consistent so that the testers uh, is working with all of those surfaces together. Oh, what you're seeing there is me taking the model out of the lighting of the uh, studio lights and looking at it under normal lighting. That's actually another really, really good piece of advice because... That's where it's going to be viewed the majority of the time is underneath that normal light. So you want it to be convincing under that light. Alrighty, that's pretty much it from me. I think the rest of this is just uh, some final tweaks and bits and bobs. So hope you've enjoyed and catch me on the socials as always. Uh, big Deno, out. <laughs>